Let's talk. Women talk. Inspired by her father, a neurosurgeon who dedicated his life to helping the underprivileged, Haying is now helping others in her own way. I had the privilege to learn about what it takes to be a social worker. Hi, your family kind of inspired uh, mm. the situation also for you to enter into social sure. work. Mm. So maybe tell me a little bit about um, how that came about. My dad, my dad used to be a neurosurgeon, but he always felt that he wasn't helping people who needed the medical, uh, the, the medical assistance when he was working in a hospital. So basically, he sold everything he ever had and wow. then moved all of us into this um, into Red Hill. He set up a free clinic there. Wow. He wanted to go where the help was needed yes, the yes. most. He had always wanted any one of us to, to take over his clinic when, when, when we grow up. It didn't happen. <laughs> I, I nearly, okay, I went into medical school, but I stayed there only one term. But I really felt it wasn't for me. And he actually told me, you know, okay, you know, fair enough, if you can't heal lives, then, you know, you can heal hearts. So, so that's where we started looking into social work. Mm. Well, this sounds really fascinating. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your social work journey. Mm, sure. So of course I took social work and then I graduated and then I became a child protection officer of the ministry. So it's where you know any kids who, who are abused and then you run in to grab that kid and then you you run out and then you bring that child to safety. Um, so, so I was doing it for about two years. Then I went into a family service center where you know everything where I took on everything anything. I was in a family service center for about five years and then during my last year there I was asked to go run a home for the destitute. And then I left because I had this, I had this opportunity to lead um, an organization helping kids, um, kids from vulnerable families. What else did you learn um, you know, and, and, and capture during this, this, this time? Mm. We have started actually putting the families we are helping into boxes. So you are low income, um, you know, with 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 uh, with family violence, perhaps, and then you need this, this, this. Okay, so so you are that. So we became very problem based. We were looking at them from what they can do, from what they are good at, from a strengths perspective. A lot of our, a lot of the people we serve, they can't work. They can't work financially in Singapore and in a lot of places. We equate being useful being able to contribute. Right. And when you say contribute, we also have a certain idea of contribution. Yeah, exactly. So, so there's always that monetary um, element to it. But what if I can tell you today that, you know, perhaps we have this person whom we are serving, he's living a good life, he only comes to us three days a week. But on two other days, he goes basking with his friends and he's having a good time. He's, he's bringing joy to the community. Can we call that quality of life? So why must quality of life be always be, be defined so narrowly by having a financial element to it? So, so I guess this is what I've started challenging <laughs> when, when I come to, to, to Sandag. How do we get the community in to be with our clients, that means we are one. It, it all started with Sarah. Uh, she was only 16 when her dad called us. Sarah has severe autism. So her mom left her when she was only two years old because her mom couldn't cope with having a child with severe autism. Mm. Things changed when her dad remarried. So finally, Sarah had an adult who was interested in her. Oh. Really wanted to spend time with her, oh. interested in knowing what she likes, what she enjoys. Then things started going downhill because then mom got pregnant and then mom had to take care of a baby brother. And I guess Sarah being severely autis uh, autistic, she couldn't express her, her grief. So she started taking it out on the baby brother. So when we got the call from the dad, it was really the dad being in distress. He, he really didn't know what to do with her anymore because um, she's, she's really you know, doing bad things to the brother and they were very worried. So they wanted her out of the house. So we told her dad, okay, why not you try sending her to us the first day she was, we were expecting her, she didn't turn up. So we found that she actually stayed, spends a lot of time in Lot 1. Lot 1 is a shopping mall near our CCK, near our Choshu Kang Centre. So she was spent about 12 hours in Lot 1. And we started trying all ways to entice her to get out of Lot 1 to come with us to our Choshu Kang Centre, which is like only about 3 to 5 minutes walk. So every day during lunchtime for 2 to 3 hours, we will engage her in Lot 1. So we started teaching her money concepts. So we thought there has to be another way again, a more sustainable way. We cannot do this alone. We approached all the shops that Sarah's frequents. Oh. Yes. 
and 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 um, with a lot of you know uh, patience and with a lot of uh, convincing, <laughs> we, we did we did some training for some stuff. Like for example, at McDonald's, we, we actually trained the staff there to um, how do you how do you even interact some with autism? How do you find out what he or she likes? So, so, so for McDonald's, for example, the staff will actually engage Sarah there for three hours every day. So as oh, wow. and when they are free, they will just sit down with her. And while we were doing all this, we started to be very famous in Lot One. People, <laughs> people started coming to us asking, "Hey, who are you? Huh? Who are you doing this?" Huh? So we started having that chance to advocate, to really share what have we stand that for. With the exactly community. to have that conversations. So we started getting different groups of people, like groups of housewives and groups of office workers who lunch. There and who could who, who came and tell us that hey you know we are here every time of the week for how long we can help you keep an, uh, an eye out That's for so nice. So we have actually formed a network of guardian angels. Every one of these people whom she had formed a relationship with for the past four months, um, four or five months, we actually form a human chain all the way from the exit of Lot One to the entrance of my CCK center. And then I remember a team of our colleagues, we were holding Sarah and we said, let's go. And she stepped out and every step of the way, she saw someone that she's familiar with, oh, wow. that she has formed a relationship with, um, that she feels safe with. And that's how she got to our to our Choo Kang Centre. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's great because I mean, one thing good about being small, a small country, is that it is very replicable because we mm -hmm. already have our different HDB estates, yes. right? And it is something that you can actually see happening. Yeah. The care that Haying and her team puts into helping her clients is incredibly admirable. She shares some advice to those interested in pursuing social work, as well as what we as a society can do to help others. You cannot save the world. <laughs> you are not Superman. <laughs> so be very patient. Um, I guess my, my, my experience with younger social workers who tend to burn out faster is because they feel, they have the expectation that I'm here to help and I will help. But if I cannot help, uh, you know, then, ooh, you know then, then I get frustrated, I get sad, I get upset. So I had one case where the, the, um, we had already closed the case because the, they, they had applied for, the couple had applied for a divorce. And the wife who was the who was being abused um, had actually moved out of the house. So 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 but three months later, what I saw on the news was she went back to the matrimonial home to pack her things and then she was strangled to death by the ex-husband. Oh my. Yeah. I couldn't work for for yes. about two or three months after that because I felt very responsible <laughs> for, for what happened. So 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 at that time I kept asking my supervisor. Could I have done something different that could have changed that? Because we are handling human lives, right? Yeah, and it gets right. messy, right? So, so, so things like that happen. What I can say to younger social workers is, you did your best, move on. And what is the most fulfilling thing for you um, being in this work? I will always remember one, one case where, um, uh, it's again at my family service centre, um, this little, little girl, um, she, she witnessed her dad committing suicide. So she stopped talking. We were getting nowhere and we thought, you know, what more can we do? And we, uh, my team and I, so, so I was the main worker, we were actually feeling a bit stressed out. But I could remember um, one day, one day, someone called me. It was her. Oh! Yeah. So she started talking. <laughs> and I could always remember that. <laughs> Must be so like rewarding for you. Oh, <laughs> what did she say to you? She just, just... Well, um, I was so happy. So, so, so I was like in a mixture of tears and I was shouting. So I was screaming and then, and then she was like, this person had gone crazy. You know, this is not the hiring I know for, 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 the, for the four years. Um, I remember her saying my name. Yeah, yeah. And then she said, hi. Yeah, and then she said, I am. It's so beautiful. It's a breakthrough, I mean, for, for inhumanity, right? Yeah. Because reaching out to someone who has experienced that much trauma yeah. and as, a, yeah. as a, such a young kid. Yeah. We live for such moments, but we don't, we cannot expect them. Yeah. We can only do our best and then see what comes. What is your hope for Singapore? And what is your hope for the Sing like, you know, different communities within Singapore? For Singapore in general, um, I'm really just hoping 
people can again step up to ask ourselves, each and every one of us, what can I do? What can I do more? What can I do better? What can I do to benefit another person in my life? A lot of organisations come in with this view that I'm helping, I'm doing good. And by doing good, I can do no wrong. But I would really feel that exactly because you're doing good, you should be even more responsible for it. Now, Haying, what is empowerment to you? Being able to lead a dignified life with choices, a life that you find meaningful, yeah, that's empowerment to me. Mm. Thank you, Haying. Very you inspired so by your work <laughs> and um, learned a lot from this interview and, um, and, and really admire what you do and how you are so grounded uh, in the work that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Haying's willingness to go beyond her call of duty shows us that we can make our society a more inclusive place for all. Because no matter how small your actions may seem, they can have a significant impact on those you meet. <laughs>